I'm less worried about the stiff students and the flexible ones. Because stiff ones, they have natural limitations. They will not go too far. But the flexible ones, they don't have these limitations. Depending on their body structure, like they have just those ligaments. And ligaments, they have very important functions. They are there to protect your joints, basically. I would, I would say strength before flexibility. And you have just flexibility. If you don't have any strength, then it is dangerous. Hey, tribe of journeymen and women. So I'm really excited to bring you this podcast. Uh, usually it takes me a few weeks to kind of prepare one for you, but I'm so excited about this one that I actually, you know, just did it, uh, have this talk today and I right away went to upload it and edit it. So I'm super excited about it. And the reason because is uh, to begin with, I made a video called why this is why yoga sucks which you know i spoke about the dark side of yoga and the downside which not often is spoken about and that's not to say that yoga is a bad practice period uh yoga can be a wonderful practice but it's also a dangerous practice and too many people i find are just talking about the good things and neglect the dark things uh and basically i was focusing on the physicality part of it and that including my own journey, I was a professional yoga instructor for around seven years, but uh, I did not know so much about how the body works. And I was kind of, you could say, putting my students in into da danger of you know hurting them, but I wasn't even aware of that to, for a long time because none of my yoga instructors really addressed that. And I found that to be the same case in so many places. And so this is why when I learned that a friend of mine knows a medical doctor who is now a professional yoga instructor and she also speaks up about those things, about the dangers that not everyone recognizes that yoga holds together with the benefits, I right away went to connect up with her and uh, the first chance we got we made this talk so again i highly recommend listening to it just a quick note to you all is that there are uh, themes if you skip through the timeline of youtube i uh, they're named in themes uh, so like you have the subject you'll see what's where so feel free to skip around and listen to what's interesting to you although i think the whole talk is interesting and if you prefer, prefer to listen to an audio version while you drive or whatever then you'll find that also in the links below so you can just go and listen to it or watch it on youtube which is better for me because i get better youtube ratings then so enjoy have a good run and i hope you will benefit from the talk as much as i did have a good one i've been looking forward for this conversation very much ever since i heard more about your work um but one thing i like to usually start the conversation with uh, it's kind of a almost like a bit of a tricky question uh, but it helps to start the conversation. Uh, I like to ask for a non, not humble version of your past achievements so that people would get, get a sense of what you went through and, and what, what's your expertise, what's your knowledge. So kind of a short version, just like, I did this, I did this, I did that. Okay, not in a humble way. <laughs> That's yeah. A, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, so... Shortly, just to sum it up, so I, well, I've been practicing yoga now, I counted just before this interview, so for 17 years, so I started pretty early, and I, I practiced also intensely, and then, like, you know, retreats and all, and mainly I enter yoga, so that was the one I started with. And then, uh, so that's, that's first, then I did uh, medical studies, and I... I had medical uh, diploma and it was like six six years. Then I did internship and then I did. I started the specialization in anesthesiology and intensive care, and it took me almost another another three years. So in total, I spent medical field so far ten years, and then uh, and then I decided to uh, as I had more time after quitting <laughs> to fulfill my dream and to go to India. And so I went there and I managed to find a very like good serious school and I spent there a few months and. So it ended the teacher training and uh, and then also assisting and, and over there. And then and then since I came back basically then I just tried to kind of bring the two together and uh, having one foot here, one foot there, like trying to combine the two and help people basically to understand themselves better and then to 
improve their lives and take the responsibility for their lives. And basically, that's what I'm aiming at at the moment. I'm just giving people the tools to be hopefully a bit healthier and a bit happier in the life. That's a short description. Great. Thank you. That, that was a great one. Uh, it, it, obviously, it fascinates me that you have a medical doctor's degree and, and the knowledge and the practice. And now you're a full-time yoga instructor from, as we spoke, us. Okay. Cool. Uh, yes. So at the moment, uh, I, I'm teaching yoga full time. Although I'm still thinking that there's so much more I can learn from medical field. So I'm considering still doing the specialization, maybe in something uh, closer to yoga, which I can combine with yoga, like me uh, physical medicine and uh, medical rehabilitation. And I think that would be a nice match. So to bring mm -hmm. them together, basically, or to take the best from, from these two. Great. I, I really like that already. And I think uh, it's a sign of a person who's on a path to kind of receive knowledge, but also on a path where knowledge has been accumulated. And what I mean by that is that it's kind of that like that joke where the less I know, the more I think I know. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And I think and, you know, I think, unfortunately, that happens in yoga as well, uh, where s there are instructors who d barely know anything, in, if we look at it objectively, but, but they don't know what they don't know, and they think they know enough, and they're not even investigating further. further. They just, you know, go through some course and maybe learn a, a new asana once a month or something, but they feel like they know enough, and they don't dive deeper. But you have all that education and the degree and the experience, and, and you're on a, in a situation where you feel like you still want to learn more. So I, I find it fascinating and, and brilliant that that's the way to go. Mm. And uh, like, it's, yeah. yeah, it's true. But on the other hand, it's also tricky because also, like, sometimes the more you know, and especially about the dangers, it can paralyze you to some extent. <laughs> because you look at the people and, like, you know, potentially how many. Uh, conditions they may have, and you know that they might they might not have any symptoms yet. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes you know, if you know too much, you need to be <laughs> Absolutely, I, I know 100% what you mean, and I actually went through that myself personally. Uh, I so I instructed yoga uh, professionally about seven years, but in total maybe like eight years or so. Anyway, same, same, same thing. But, uh, but when I started doing it on my own, in my own school, uh, I actually, somewhere in the back of my mind, I felt and recognized, not like 100%, but I, I felt that I lack the, the real necessary knowledge. My part of me kind of realized it. And, and as you said, it was paralyzing, especially the, the first couple of years. I, I felt like, the, the, and the, the, the difficulty was, the challenge that I was given this certificate to teach, I was encouraged yeah. to teach which I don't, to today now, I think that was not a correct thing to do. But, but then I had the degree, officially I was supposed to teach, but every time I would teach, I would, there was a little voice in the back of my mind which would say, do I really know what I need to know? And in my case, it was way worse even because you are a doctor, you know already so much. I didn't have that luxury. So, so yeah, I know 100% what you mean. And I think it's, it's great you're, you're mentioning that. But it's, it's interesting too that you still... You, even while having all that knowledge, you still feel a little bit of that challenge, it seems like. Uh, is that is that true? Yeah, it is very true. Like, because this is just such a huge knowledge. And after, um, even if you spend like six, uh, during the six years of studies, this knowledge is so huge that, you know, you, you know a bit about everything, and, but deeply, in depth, not really. So that's why... Like this is six years of the studies, and then usually five, six years of specialization too, because like it's a completely different new world. So, and this is, I think, it's endless because then you are a specialist, but still, like, still there are like things are changing, and mm -hmm. then and then especially and combining with yoga, like yoga, what I love about it, it's so much about your experience, experience, and about you really have to experience it on your mat. Like medicine is more intellectual. Uh, but yeah, but then so then you can you have these two things. So one thing you know in theory how much you know, and the second thing is like the more you explore also on the map, the more you see like you know the more questions you have, <laughs> and it's like and also the more students you have, then then they uh, they often they just uh, you get surprises with that as well because 
you think this way, you experience it this way, you think theoretically it makes sense, but for this very person, <laughs> mm-hmm. might not. So, and then you realize it's again and again, like it's more and more, and then you can just you cannot ever say, I know, because for sure, and uh, yeah, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, and if you ever find a teacher who says, I know everything, and then that's how it is, and just do it as my way, then it usually means that you can uh, change the school. <laughs> Mm. in the future because it's it's more in I I really like your approach and perspective and you also remind me of a friend of mine who just recently told me uh, it was a different subject but I think it's universal he said if somebody claims to be an expert probably they're not very good (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's also another of many things like like also ego and as you said like if you know very little it seems super simple like well, I know everything. I no, because it's so little, so easy to grasp. And then, and then you, if you start dig deeper, then you're like, oh my god, <laughs> there is so much more. Uh, and then it's, uh, I, I think it's the really a like life journey. Uh, and basically, that's what life is about: just learning every day from everything, mm-hmm. not only medicine, not only yoga, but everything you do in daily life. I agree. Uh, there's one thing which is at the top of my mind, and uh, so first off, I didn't mention we have a mutual friend, uh, Linda, yeah. and I, I think she, she, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she, she mentioned that uh, you went to, study, uh, to go for a certification, a yoga certification, instructor certification in, to India, but then, if, if, so if that's true, the other thing is, I think she mentioned that you were horrified by, it's a strong word, but. I, I presume it may be true. Uh, you were horrified by some of the postures you would see and some of the things that were taught because you would recognize that it's not healthy uh, from your knowledge as as a as a doctor. Or is that is that a true story, or did I misrepresent that? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. So I went to India to, to do the teacher training, and I was actually I was actually very happy with my school. So I did a long research, and as you may know, as, uh, before I because I made my made up my mind that I wanted to go to India and uh, live there. It was like my life long dream to uh, to actually go to the place of origin of yoga and do my teacher training over there. And then as I started to make research to actually do school, I got horrified. Because then then I got horrified because then it's like it's such a huge business. So you have thousands of schools, and then. And for most of them, like it was enough for me, you know, to see even what they were offering on, like, well, how their website was looking. I was like, that's not for me. And then so it was. It took me quite a long time. And then I was lucky I had to find uh, Shara Deroda. So that's where I went. As, and actually, I met him before he came to Poland. He was giving a workshop, and he's very experienced teacher. So he has like four, 40 years of experience, and he was also for seven years. He was. Uh, uh, almost 37 years, he was assistant of Vika's Iyengar in all his classes. Uh, and also he practices Vipassana meditation with me and I think very serious Vipassana meditators for me it was really important. Uh, that, uh, because I'm not looking for any other kind of meditations. And most of other schools they were proposing some meditation, which I was not interested in. So, so then I was like, okay. and then he was also organizing like to even start the teacher training, you had to take part in a 20 days intensive course, which was, I could see that he was inspired by Vipassana because this was 20 days in silence. I mean, our silence, he could talk. <laughs> and then it would start 4 a.m. in the morning, it was in the ashram in the middle of the jungle. And it was a very beautiful place and very great group of people like we really see serious about what we were doing. And they really liked his approach because he actually, he, he um, he's, he's like, I don't, looking for a good word, not simplified, but to some extent, yes, I anger my thoughts. So he like took a few steps back, he removed most of the postures and and he uses like three times more props, uh, props meaning equipment like blankets, chairs and, and uh, other stuff. He removed a headstand, like a usual headstand and he replaced it with hanging, which has the same benefits but the same for the neck. And then, and then he was really, all about like alignment, footwork, working the, like the whole body working as a whole rather than adjusting separately, no pushing at all in the poses. 
uh, I mean, okay, not all of them, but <laughs> like he okay. had some poses that you think. But uh, in general, I really, I really appreciated it. And obviously, I did not. And the same, like I really appreciated him, and I really, I'm, so, I will be forever grateful for what I've learned. Le learned, <laughs> sorry for my English. I've learned right. from him, uh, but uh, but it doesn't mean that I agree with everything. Same. It doesn't mean that everything would make sense to me, and some things didn't, but majority they did. So, so no, the experience with, with the teacher training itself was good. Uh, this one, at least. <laughs> and uh, and I, I still use uh, lots of things that I've learned. With them. So, so no. But what I think I was actually kind of terrified was like that in India, actually, when I went there finally, like. Every single, not single, every second house in touristic areas, especially. So I went to Dharamshala. It's like teacher training, teacher training, <laughs> and mm. all certified by whatever. And then you would start question, like, it just looks like a big business. And maybe some, I guess many of these schools are genuinely trying to do their best. I guess everyone is trying to do their best, but, but the, like, we need to ask always a question about the quality of the well, it, it's really great when I hear you say that you put research or it sounds like you put research into choosing your uh, certification program. And on the other hand, I think there are so many, especially in India, I've, I've spent only a month in India, but I, I think I've seen plenty of that, of what you speak of, those certification programs on every corner. And they, obviously they are there because there's enough student base. There's enough yeah. people who go there and pay. So basically that says that most people don't do the research. They just go walk and they're like, oh, look, there's a certification program. I'm just going to do it. So what, what do you think about that? And, it, and maybe I'll just add this kind of a sharp part to it. But, but personally, what I'm concerned about is people just getting into those random uh, yoga certification programs and they get taught for a month and then they go back and they teach full time. So, so what, what do you think about that? What's, what's your perspective? Yeah, it's a tricky question because uh, uh, I think, yeah, I think it's like if someone who wants to do the teacher training, it, it's very important to make a proper research. What is tricky is that like many people, which I can understand, they're hired with their job, let's say, and then they think, Wow, like, it would be so nice to have purpose in life. Have this office job, so let's let's do and and do the teacher training to become a yoga teacher because then it has purpose and and you work with people and you're you know you're your own master. So and then we are quite like generally uh, as uh, people these days we're quite impatient. We are living in insta instant everything is instant. So then you're right. like okay so. You check the internet and you see I can do it in two months or one month. <laughs> <Two> it's <weeks>. so <Okay>. good. <laughs> so so this then it's a shortcut. And uh, and then yes, and then especially if you don't research your school well enough. But even if you do, if if you decide uh, to to just go immediately for this very intensive practice and immediately to do the teacher training and without previously having like well established practice and without also practicing first, without having this in mind that I'm going to be yoga teacher, just practicing because you love it, just practicing because it's great for you. And then at some point you come to, the, to this um, conclusion that yes, it worked so well for you that you want to give it to others. So I think maybe that's more like a natural right way to be. But on the other hand, I'm sure that all these people, they just have the best intentions and, and they just genuinely want to do something full of purpose and then they probably also are really struggling with their, where they are at at the moment and that's why they, they might decide to do the shortcut. Also many people they just do just teacher training for their own development not necessarily to teach up. So, so it depends on the case but yes in general it is tricky and then I've heard about some schools in India I haven't been there myself so, so that's why it's, I'm just saying what I've heard, but I believe it was right. true. Like just some people decided to, you know, to open a yoga school because it seemed a good business without having any <laughs> background. And then it is the best scale, and that's also not ethically correct. Like it's, this is wrong. If someone just does it because 
because he hopes to, to get money out of it, then Hmm. I, I, I believe I'm, I'm with you here, but I'm out, out of curiosity, if you would comment, why would you say it's unethical? Uh, could you say a few more words so that whoever is listening uh, would, would really understand what you mean by that? So I think if, if your only motivation to either become a teacher or to teach the teachers, like, so to create the program, if your only motivation is to make a profit of it, and then maybe also make a profit of people's desperation or of people's situation. Like, like as I said, like, so some people, like, they're just so desperate in their lives and they really want to make a change. They really want to go and do the teacher training, let's say, or, or just a normal training. And if you take advantage of it, and if you don't want to genuinely uh, help them, and then if you make this shortcut, <laughs> Knowing that it's wrong, uh, and you knowing that they need no more time, but doing the shortcut because you take it as a marketing tool, then this is wrong. <laughs> then mm. it means that you that then your motivation was crooked. <laughs> then your motivation was not genuinely doing what would be best for them, but rather trying to find the customers and trying to guess what they need and providing them what they want, but what you know is uh, it's not going to hurt them, but the opposite. Mm, right. I think you know when I think about that whole situation. I guess it's almost like two levels. There are people who know that they're abusing it, and uh, and that's that makes it way worse. But also, as you mentioned, there's most of probably the majority of people they they have good intentions, uh, but some people just don't know what they don't know. I guess we all don't know what we don't know, but some people are not even, uh, they don't even realize that there's something they don't know. And one of my kind of missions that I feel like I'm on and hopefully, uh, I'll, well, I'm hoping to kind of deliver some of that knowledge through the help of people like yourself is trying to re put some more light on the aspect of um, what people might not be aware of. And uh, having said that, my question basically is uh, when you look at, yoga or the kind of the general yoga, the majority of uh, how yoga is taught, uh, are there some parts which concern you where you look at some postures or some approach of teaching and, uh, and you recognize that this is actually dangerous and you, you, you would hope that this would not continue? Well, there are, there is, uh, there are a few things. So actually the, like the, the poses I consider uh, quite dangerous and uh, which are used very commonly because they are called king and queen, uh, is uh, of asanas, asanas meaning uh, yoga postures. So is actually headstand and shoulders. And because, especially like headstand is tricky because headstand is easy to do, <laughs> surprisingly, especially if you use the wall. Like to come into the headstand, you don't need much. And especially if the teacher comes and puts you in, that you know, you can put anyone in headstand. But, uh, but this is a very dangerous spot because if you look at the anatomy of the spine, like basically the, the cervical spine, so the neck area, if you look at the shape, if you look at the size even of the vertebrae, like the neck is basically very mobile, so we can move it all around. <laughs> but it's not very stable because it's supposed to carry our head, maybe, maybe not much more. And then the lower you go, the bigger, there is more stability and probably less mobility. So your lumbar, or especially if you can lower the sacrum, it's not as mobile. Uh, so, and what is happening, and I think well, that's what we all need to keep in mind if we learn yoga, and we live in the West especially, it is an imported technique. So basically it comes from a different land where people especially as it was developed, they live a different way. So for example, what happens in India, people actually, or oh, other countries, people carry a lot on their head, or on their head, and especially in the old times. Like I, I spent a few months in Nepal and then what I, in a, a, a village, and then what I noticed in this village was like the children, <laughs> very soon after they were probably, would already start carrying on their head, heavy loads. So for them, like they have completely different necks, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. honestly to say. And, uh, 
And the way it doesn't maybe necessarily mean that no one in the West can ever do headstand, but everyone should, should be super cautious with these falls, especially knowing that pain is a very late symptom. So the fact that you don't have pain yet in your neck or wherever, it doesn't mean that you have a head. And instead, it doesn't mean that you, you also that you have a strong muscles to carry the heavy, heavy load on your head. Because as you do the headstand, and especially if you're not experienced practitioner, and I saw headstand being taught in the first class, uh, then what you do, you basically whatever you weigh, even, even if you weigh 60 kilos, it usually means that you put more than 50% of your weight all by sudden on your cervical spine. So it's, it's all by sudden 30 kilos on, <laughs> on your neck, which was absolutely not prepared for that. And you just, you know, you have your office work and you go to yoga twice a week or once a week, or you've just started and then all by sudden you do this, uh, uh, you do this. And then you might, you might not uh, experience anything serious after the first time you did the pose and then it's more tricky, it can come with time. So you just keep repeating it. And, uh, and then and then it adds on, it adds on, and it adds on, and at the end, it can be quite dangerous. So, yeah, so like one has to be such super cautious with this pose. And that's why for me, and what I do, and what uh, also that's what Charles was teaching, and also that's what I teach my students. I don't teach headstand myself. I do, I mean, I do, but the version uh, that you hang on, like, so you have a rope, and the rope is around your feet, and then you go upside down. And then also, and then again, not for everyone. <laughs> so because this can only means that your neck is safe, but it doesn't mean like, but it's still upside down. So you need to be cautious, like of all the contraindications, which you have got. there is quite some. So if, some, if someone has a, a high blood pressure, if someone has high intraocular pressure, if someone has the heart problem, so there's like a long list of contraindications still. So this one first, and this is a similar uh, shoulder stand. So shoulder stand, that's a really big one. I can talk forever, so stop me if, I, <laughs> if it's too, too long. So when it comes to shoulder stand, basically, I never ever neither do or teach or teach shoulder stand without support. So shoulder stand, you need uh, at least five blankets. So you need to make a height. If you don't put the height under your shoulders and you do it on the floor, then basically you less than the shoulder stand you do more neck stand right. yeah. and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's super dangerous and then and then also especially if you do the next step and then you turn your hand your head <laughs> to the side because you look at your teacher then right. Right. so like lots of stuff like that so you, like shoulder stand one has to be super careful and then also at the beginning uh, oh that's why i was i was taught back then like you know that you start with halas so basically the plow pose so straight away you're on your neck and you put your <laughs> you're like behind your head and that, that's just quite much for me so so like first you walk with your feet on the, on the wall then you check how it feels you stay on the wall for a long time first you learn where is your shoulder learn how it's feeling in your neck and then maybe one day you try to go uh, further but it's uh, but people are impatient it's the same problem students are impatient they come, they don't know how to stand on their feet, and but they already want <laughs> to stand on their head. And that's very true. Mm. Yeah, please don't hesitate about speaking out everything. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to hear all of it. So, and I appreciate already you sharing this. And uh, that also actually leads me to another kind of similar question is, uh, especially these days, because yoga, I think, uh, is very popular. It's almost like a fashion statement sometimes, including yoga pants and whatnot. But, <laughs> but then, and you also have all these Instagram, for example, Instagram influencers, superstars, uh, who are some of them yogis, and they often demonstrate. But that also that also applies on a regular class. I think it happens on regular class as well. But but we see these hyper flexible people who do these incredibly complicated postures twist themselves in all, all shapes and forms or complicated forms of headstands, etc., etc., etc. And I think it kind of sets up this idea that that's what yoga is about or, or that this is like the, the, the end goal of every yogi. 
And I think it's, and I, I can say I've been there myself as a, as when I started learning yoga when I was 19, uh, I was actually the, one of the least flexible people in the group because I trained not in a smart way in the past. Uh, but then I would see my instructors do these hyper flexible moves and I would try to kind of push myself to the edge to, to replicate that. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Uh, but looking at that whole hyper flexibility and all those very difficult, complicated postures, uh, would you say it's uh, part of it? Part of my question is, would you say it's, it's okay to do them in general? Like if you reach that high, high level of flexibility, does it make sense at all to do it? And on the other hand, uh, it, what dangers are there uh, for people, especially who are not ready to try to do that? So it's kind of a mix of those two. Yeah, it's a great question. So basically, yeah, that's that's definitely very tricky and very bad. Like it's it's actually one of the biggest danger, I would say, like to me, which I see uh, myself as well. That there is now this connotation with yoga mm. uh, means like doing these acrobatic uh, exercises. And because that's how you see it in magazines, that's how you see it. Uh, like even if you Google yoga, the images you see is like a scorpion pose <laughs> or other poses, yeah. like very, very, very advanced. And this leads to this belief that that's what it is about. And especially having, again, I'm coming back to it over and over again, but it's very important, having this mindset that we see so often these days, like, achiever mindset, ego, ego driven mindset, like the thinking that I need to, you know, be this and that, and that is dangerous because that's how you hurt yourself. And then like, to me, what yoga is about ideally, or how I find it, like with my personal view, it's like really, and that's how, what I try to teach as well. It's like, you really get to understand how your body works. You really get to understand um, yourself. You, you, Use the poses to, like, yes, obviously to, to improve your health and to improve your one of them flexibility and the strength, but mainly to just reconnect with your body because we all live in the head a lot. Mm -hmm. And with computer era, everyone's in the head. So what happens now? People who are in the head, disconnected from their body. They see mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in their mind, no, this is okay, that's what it is about. And from their head, disconnected from their body, they go for these difficult movements. And that's when they get hurt. And then what happens in the class often, I mean, well, let's see. No, I don't want also to say, you know, to generalize too much, like not to hurt people's feelings. But uh, what happens, what can happen is, like, for example, forward bends. Uh, these are very dangerous, again, poses. And because they are quite strenuous for the spine. And then we know all, I think, most of people know that someone like bent forward, not on yoga class, just trying to pick something from the floor and <laughs> didn't make it to, to straighten up. And that's also because like people have very poor posture, really poor movements in general. So they go to yoga class and then if they are just said, you know, put, try to go down and put your hands on the floor, and then they, they focus these hands on the floor <laughs> in the forward bend, so, like teacher does. Then they go now. They don't have the flexibility first, in the, usually in their hips to do that. So they compensate. Where do they compensate? Like they use what is mobile anyway. So they abuse it basically, and that's how their spine gets worse. So that's why I think it's very important that as you teach poses or if you show them, like you should they really concentrate on the direction rather than result. So rather than showing people like, oh look how beautiful like this head is here. <laughs> <laughs> and then people, yeah, that's the aim. <laughs> it's rather like, no, like, like yoga is about acceptance. So first you start, you accept where you're at. Then you try to understand where, where you're going to basically the movement. Then you do your best. And then you let go of the results. And then you don't compare yourself to balance. Basically, that's how a it should be. Especially <laughs> that coming back to the fact that yoga is important technique and coming back to what poses are dangerous is uh, like, for example, lotus. And that's what happens to many teachers. And that was recently the article, don't you remember which, uh, which newspaper was it? About like how many yoga teachers have uh, hip replacements. Mm. And it's, it's because 
as a yoga teacher, many teachers, I also face this. Uh, it's like you think you should be able <laughs> to do these poses, like students might not, but you have to. So people like force themselves to, uh, to lotus. But what we need to understand again is that like when it comes to lotus and it comes to your hips, lots of things are decided. For example, the fact if you will be able to ever do the lotus safely in your life, it's decided during your first 10 years of your life. <laughs> so okay. if, you, if you started your yoga when you were more than that, or if you're in 20s, even 20s, 30s or later on, then slow down because hip joints, uh, hip joints is actually not mature when you're born. So it's like still like lots of cartilage there. And it's same as you think about the clay. So a clay, if you make a pot of clay, like as long as it's wet, so let's say it's a cartilage, yes, then you can shape it, you can change it and all. So if you're lucky enough that during this phase of your life, you sit on the floor, you squat in the toilet, you walk a lot, you know, you, have, you keep your hips open, you're lucky, you probably, yes, will be able to do your lovers. But <laughs> if your parents put you in the chair uh, or your childhood then probably, and then you sit on the, on the, uh, in the toilet, then probably you won't. Because exactly the same in this metaphor with the clay, well, once your pot made of clay is dry, if you then try to change it, you can break it. And exactly the same applies to our hips. It doesn't mean that they will not, that there's nothing you can do. Yes, they can still, you can gain more flexibility at all, but you have to be very slow, very careful, remembering what you're working with, and then not trying to push it because otherwise you can just damage permanently. All right. Yes, I already. So, it was long. Oh no! <laughs> I didn't answer your question. One hundred percent. I asked something in addition to that, but I, I wanted to say again: please don't hold, hold yourself back. I, I really appreciate you speaking about that, and it's exactly what I'm looking for. So, so it's very good. Uh, one one part that I did want to add as a question is. A hyperflexibility itself, I, I overheard this once and I just never had a chance to confirm it. So I'm curious to what's your opinion that uh, apparently uh, potentially hyperflexibility is not healthy to begin with. Like if the joints are, yeah. if the muscles are, joints are too flexible, I guess you already have something to say about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and that's another thing. So, like flexibility, like, I'm less worried about the stiff students than flexible ones. <laughs> mm, yeah. Because stiff ones, they have natural limitations. They will not go too far. But the flexible ones, they don't have these limitations. And then usually it just means that depending on their body structure, like they have just loose ligaments. And ligaments, they have very important functions. They are there to protect your joints, basically. So, and it's always, like I would, I would say strength before flexibility and you have just flexibility if you don't have any strength then it is dangerous and then that's why like actually over flexible people are very attracted to yoga because that's common that we are attracted mm. to what is easy <laughs> right, and I guess you can see it as well like the poses that they are nice and easy or we really like to do a lot and there are those but actually those who we need are the difficult ones like the ones that we are not so good at. And that's why actually stiff people, they should go to yoga classes. Well. Like, I mean, everyone should forgive them. But uh, yes, but then, and then they will, because it's easy, they will push themselves maybe too much, even though they should like build their strength to be able to protect the joints and protect themselves because they are just simply collapsing, they're just too loose. So that's, that's a very important question, a very important topic. And yes, like they should work more on building their strength to basically be able to hold themselves together. Mm. Yeah, again, uh, I really appreciate you saying that. And uh, that, that actually, again, just it's a question after a question that, uh, that I'm heading on. And I hope I'm not asking, I'm not going to bombard you with too many complicated questions. Uh, but again, I'm just you know, happy to have a person who, who's, who has the ability to answer. Uh, one of the subjects that I bring up sometimes as a thought, I, I read it actually got that idea from a book, which I enjoyed a lot about. It's kind of the 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 bright and the dark side of yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really curious to hear your opinion. So, so when you look at when we look at the world of uh, medicine in general, uh, and I think Switzerland is a, is a 
kind of a almost too much of an example, but from the experience I, I gathered, knowledge I gathered in Switzerland, it's really difficult to get like if you're not a medical expert, like let's say you want to do acupuncture or some other alternative type of medicine, they they're really strict about the uh, the the conditions to let the people do it, and I, I personally feel like that's that's actually a good thing because that happens with the with alternative medicine but even worse i think with yoga we kind of it's kind of in a, in a gray zone we don't most people don't recognize it as a medical practice or they don't put that much emphasis on it it's kind of like a hobby a thing to do and so then we get those instructors who those people who go to india or anywhere pass a three week course have no further or knowledge or beforehand knowledge and they go back and teach having very little education very little knowledge of what they do what's really working what's not working and there's no one to supervise that and to me that's a bit scary and when i think about the people i know that i don't want to be too heavy but but it's my honest opinion that from the people i met who taught yoga uh like who were my let's say colleagues or friends from that realm i i would be willing to say that most of them wouldn't get permission to teach if there was a high standard of uh, safety measures for like uh, whether they're allowed to teach or not. Uh, but what, what do you personally think about that concept idea of some kind of a gov governmental structure or, or universal recognition of what's the minimum you have to know to be allowed to teach yoga? Do you think that's a good idea or is it difficult to make it happen? So what, what do you think? Yeah, it's a tricky question because, like, I would say that, would, like, if that it would apply to everyone, like, not only yoga teachers, but everyone who works with the body. <laughs> so there's yoga, but there's also fitness, there's also martial arts. Like, I yes. personally know a person who's uh, who got seriously injured during the martial arts classes, and it was cool, cool. And, yes. and I, like, when I heard the stories, I was like, "What did you ever do?" And then, so where, wherever you move, like, you know, martial arts, fitness classes, personal trainers, like everyone who work with the body, like should take some responsibility. So yes, like, you know, and especially in Switzerland or everywhere, like we try to like have everything, I don't know, like this diploma, this diploma, it's sometimes it's sometimes also too much, like that, you know, that we suffocate. And it's also like what, uh, what I was finding sometimes maybe people in medicine because like then it's all everything about guidelines like you have guidelines that guidelines that and then you have to follow if you don't follow you know then 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 you are in trouble uh, but and it's a kind of also to some extent it's uh, it's a uh, it's it's like that you know like many people take yoga as an art and and then um, you know you, you can have different angles but definitely. I would agree that anyone who works with people, anyone who works with people's body, like they should try at least to, you know, to understand as much as they as, as possible. I don't know if necessarily with official certification or not, but also, and I think it's like double important that, like one thing is the teacher, but second thing is a student. And then any of us as a student, like should. And we also, as a teacher, should encourage the students like to really trust themselves and really listen to their bodies because sometimes they tend to like think that teacher knows the best. But, or say like, like that's what happens in medicine. Like patient often comes to you and it's like, okay, this is my body, fix it, and then give it back to me when it's fixed. But no, also also like the patient and also student is like responsible. Needs to like teacher proposes something like took his best his this person's best knowledge and best intention and then it can be great for one person but bad for another one and then especially it's a tricky in group classes that's why I'm more I'm concentrating on private classes because in group classes you have even if you have five people or ten people like each of them very often you have like over flexible one and then for stiff one they need opposite things like you propose one thing and if we break one have another one <laughs> so this is this is tough and that's why people like need to like like keep it in mind like to, to trust themselves to listen to their body if they feel any doubt discomfort anything they should, we need to leave the, the post immediately and even if teacher pressures them it doesn't matter 
especially I think it's a challenge for any teacher, you know, the best teacher or oh, very experienced one with 40 years of experience and they have uh, like uh, 20 people or 30 or sometimes they're supposed to have 40 or 60 people in one room. And then they propose something, but it doesn't mean it applies to everyone. And then especially mm-hmm. if someone decides to go to the group classes, they really need to keep it in mind and ideally be reminded by the teacher that if anything feels wrong, then they should feel leave the pause immediately. Or even if someone asks them to do the headstand, they have freedom to say no. <laughs> and yeah. then and then they should really like be cautious of it. And then if anything feels wrong in your own body, then and then and then you leave the pose and then if the teacher pressures you still to do it, then you can just keep the class and this way like trial and error the good life too. So you just, you know, you look, you also take responsibility to, to look for your teacher, to research your teacher, to, you know, to do all the necessary help homework yourself at the moment. Yeah, but- I really appreciate you saying that. That's 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 what I think as well. And uh, it's sometimes too bad that there is that peer pressure, and like especially if 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 and I've been there too, being the least flexible person in the group. You see everyone else doing these hyper poses, and and then it feels like I have to do that, even if the instructor says uh, says you don't yes. have to. There is a bit of that peer pressure, but it's, it makes it so much worse if that, the culture is about enforcing that and suggesting that, yeah. no, you should push through. Uh, yeah. But actually, there's, there's one part which really frustrates me personally, and I'm curious if, if, if you feel a similar way about that. Uh, I don't know how common that is in various yoga schools, but I know of one specific school who would, or line of teaching, where pushing the students into the poses was a practice. I, I saw your eyebrows being raised, so I presume you, you, you feel a similar way about that. But so basically, yeah, a person would be, let's say, even like a forward bend, and the instructor would come and push. And I actually spoke with a friend of mine just recently who said uh, he was in one of the major yoga studios in London, and uh, the instructor was, let's say, a pusher. And yeah. interestingly enough, my friend, who's, who's not about he's not like a polite person who would not say no uh the instructor came to push and he said please don't do it i don't want that and the instructor would say i know what i'm doing trust me i'm going to do it anyway and he would say he would repeat it again like like he said it i think three times and the instructor kept insisting until basically they just had this conflict which is ridiculous but uh, but i think it happens it does happen it's not like a one-time thing but again, I, I, I have a feeling that you're not fond of uh, yoga teachers pushing people in poses. No, I mean, like, one has to be just so super car- careful with corrections. So, like, like for yoga teacher, it's going to be a correction, so a manual correction, so you come and, and have students in the pose. And, like, I think one can never be careful enough. And if student says no, no means no. <laughs> like, you need to respect that. And forward bends, like, and uh, yes, I'm like super sensitive about this topic because myself, I got hurt like that. Oh, so I wow. haven't got to talk about it, yes. But I, I st- as, as I said, I started my practice when I was 16, so it was, was pretty young and healthy. And then actually, I developed back problem and hip problem due to yoga practice. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, and that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, so basically, like being pushed. And like first being pushy myself, and I think at the time I didn't really yet understand how to do the forward bends. I find them very, very dangerous as well. If you yeah. don't understand what is the purpose, and if you have this idea in your mind that it's all about grabbing, like you know, grabbing your feet and pushing yourself to your leg, and your hands are strong, so you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's bad enough if you do it yourself. Even worse, when someone comes to you and do it to you. And what happened to me? I already was having a bit of an issue. And then I was doing Paschimottanasana with a super experienced teacher. Like, I couldn't find more experienced teacher than this one. He was, you know, practicing with my younger family for a long time and all. Very experienced. So I was trusting him a lot. And then what happened, he, I, I was in Pashimotanas and I was like, yeah, I'm getting more flexible. So what he decided to do, not only with his hands, oh, so I explained what is Pashimotanas and I know you know, but in general, so basically you sit with your with your legs straight and then you grab your feet and then you 
bent forward towards your legs. So I grabbed my feet, like my head was about like more or less on my knees level. And then the teacher decided to help me in the pose, and he actually, and he was quite heavy, he sat on my back in the pose. And then oh, yeah. I couldn't breathe, obviously, and it sounds drastic, right? <laughs> it was drastic. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so, so basically that was, I, I just don't know what he was doing. And I, and I was like, first of all, I couldn't talk. <laughs> Because I was squashed on <laughs> my leg, like I was trying to breathe. And then he let everyone out of the pose and get me in the pose still, like, you know, all, like, still, like with all his weight. Uh, like, so this huge weight and like my, my spine is very vulnerable position on the forward back. So that was, uh, that was really scary. And, uh, and since then it, were, it got even worse. And so to the extent that I really had to like even stop practicing for some time. And then, and then when I stopped practicing, I felt better, but then I was trying to come back to the practice and then leave the practice, I would get the symptoms again, the pain and everything. So it took me years to understand like what I was doing wrong. And, and actually it put me on this path of trying to find out like uh, how to move, not only on yoga mat, but in general, like how to move uh, in a healthy way. Because like you really need, it's, I think it's you teach yoga, you practice yoga, it doesn't matter if you teach your practice. You need to understand uh, like the like the movement itself, the, like how you come into the pose. Doesn't matter the final final of the pose. Doesn't matter how the pose look at the end. You need to like understand how you go in, and then check. And then you need to be patient and check on every millimeter. And this pain really taught me that that you go one millimeter, <laughs> then you check, mm -hmm. and then you go further. And then it takes time. It takes patience. And uh, we are not patient, but that's the only way to me. Mm. So no pushing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, that's my philosophy. <laughs> and not friends, and not, and if the student says no, it, it, it's, 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 like, you need to respect it. Right, 100%. And I'm happy you agree, because I just get so frustrated. Even when I think about that, I just get so mad, and then I, yeah, I'm happy to hear that your perspective is, is the same. Uh, and one more thing is something I, I wanted to ask uh, initially already, and, and you actually brought it up yourself, the aspect of group training. And, and I find it as well, like with the accumulated knowledge that I gathered and kind of I dissected and looked at what I did not know about yoga. And I, I, I realized, oh, that's probably, that wasn't a good idea from even myself teaching. Uh, as you mentioned, people have very different backgrounds in, in, in regards yeah. to their bodies and their traumas they experienced. And these days, like pretty much everyone has some pain somewhere or some injury. Uh, but then usually the way yoga classes are taught is it's generalized. It's everybody does the same thing. Maybe sometimes there's degrees, like I, I, even myself or other instructors, they would show like, this is level one, this is level two, this is level three, but still we're all doing more or less the same thing. So it's, it's really complicated situation. On the other hand though, what what would your advice be for uh, this approach? Like, w how can yoga instructors uh, make that situation somewhat better, if if it's possible, to make sure that that's adjusted to? Yeah, it's a very it's a very good question and very difficult to answer. Because for me myself, also I find it very difficult, and that's why, like at the moment, I uh, I mainly give private class sessions. Right. Uh, because right. Uh, because I find them um, like the most uh, uh, they bring me the most me I think I think they're the best for both the teacher and the student because then you can really focus on this person and then you can meet them wh where they are at like in terms of uh, everything basically even the way they feel this way this day and then you can really get to know your student well because what is happening in the group class is that you have quite a random bunch of people. So it depends on like there are sometimes close classes, but in most of the studios where it's like, you know, you can come whenever you want by, by the, the pass. <laughs> and so, and then you don't, there is not even, as, uh, uh, no one even subscribed for your class. So, so you just get to see <laughs> students when they are in their class. So it's even difficult to, to plan your class uh, beforehand. And um, so that's why yeah, ideally, uh, ideally I love to, to practice like one to one, one to one, and one, and then and then I have time to do like a, take first do proper interviews or to find out 
like all the medical history, all the things, and I can observe this person and all. So this is ideal. And especially if someone has any intuitions. Uh, but in general, yes. But obviously, like first of all, uh, private classes are in general like more uh, more expensive and, and like many people also like to go to, uh, to yoga school because this is a community as well and so there is a social aspect and there is this group energy and and I also I, I keep giving uh, not many but I keep giving some group classes and I like it too but then like for me I'm just super cautious <laughs> so I yeah. usually do uh, like simplify these classes so I adjust the level rather to the weakest student, which is sometimes also uh, to some extent frustrating. Like when you have students like coming to the class every day or like uh, every week, they're in your class, and then you have someone who is there for the first time or second time, and then you can somehow find the balance. And it's yeah, it's, it's tricky for myself. So I try to you know make it as safe as I can. I can try to cover as many information as I can. I rather go for the easier stuff than the people one, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, and I try to remind them over and over, like you know, <laughs> don't be ambitious. <laughs> or ambitious enough outside, just you know, listen to your body. And but and and also, I think that's that's the key, like to tell people, like you know, listen to yourself, not necessarily follow what they say. Like check <laughs> how it is in your very body today. I think that that's very important to remind them that because otherwise they just will be forcing themselves. They will be anyway. <laughs> Maybe that. I, I agree. That that was actually my experience as well. And and it's one of the parts which I, I'm happy that because when I look back at my uh, career as a yoga instructor, I'm I'm very unsatisfied about many things, like how I was taught and uh, uh, how and how I taught others because of the lack of knowledge I had. Uh, but one of the things I'm happy is both uh, of what my instructors gave and both what I even emphasized even more in myself is is what you mentioned that being super con, con, cautious, being yeah. uh, always reminding, always reminding the students like don't push it, don't push it. Like like as you said, most people still will push it, but then I, I noticed too. Like if I say ten times, the, it will still decrease their level of ambitiousness. Yeah. And so yeah, but I, I think and usually I just like if especially if I see them pushing themselves, I just come and say like. This post is not about that. <laughs> you know, for example, with forward bend, like because you can, that's very easy actually to see. Uh, you know where they are, like if they compensate or not compensate, meaning like you know they because they don't have any flexibility in hamstrings in, in the pelvis, so they just overuse. Fine, and then it, then you can see it immediately. So so then I just like no, come back up, <laughs> take blood, and, and then I take even how many you have, but I'll, usually I try to, you know, to check on as many as I can, and, and then just give them equipment and try to make them fine about using because some people feel for some reason that using equipment using props it's i don't know they, they don't feel good about mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's also the limitations that very important mm, got it uh, there's a few more questions that I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, and one of them is kind of an intermediate one, uh, almost funny to a degree, but, but also scary at the same time. Uh, so I don't have a yoga book with me at the moment uh, where I'm at, but uh, I, I have vivid memories of reading some of the classical yoga books, and not like even that old, like I guess just like from 10 years ago, uh, written by Indian yoga instructors. Or even there's some, I think that that knowledge was passed on to the West. Uh, but there would be some, in my opinion, ridiculous uh, explanations of what some postures do. Like the example I remember uh, as one of the main ones I like to give is, for example, that the tr it was written in the book that the triangle uh, reduces the fat on the hips or something like that. And it's, and, and it's just, I think it's just a, fairly common, hopefully it's decreasing, but I think it's a fairly common phenomenon for uh, yoga, some of the yoga books to explain what are the benefits of the posture without actual source of knowledge, without any scientific proof. And some of them just go way off, I think. And I'm curious, have you bumped in some of those as well where you read and, and said, this does not make any sense and maybe you have some examples as well. 
Uh, well, so yeah, it's a good question. So yes, uh, there's plenty of books and uh, like uh, plenty of websites, and plenty of like right? saying like this falls for that and this falls for that and this has this miracle effect uh, and this has another. And I think well, like it's uh, also difficult to also difficult to answer because what also makes yoga different than, than like let's say medical science is that in medicine you really have to prove everything and you make a research on it but uh, it's, it's tricky because like then you know you have you you really have to find this thing that is working on this exact thing and you have to make sure that it's really connection between the two and you have a trial group and you know but in yoga it's more about personal experience. So it does not necessarily come from, from the research, which has a good reason because it's very difficult to make research on yoga. Now there's more and more, but if you look for the research that was made, it's quite general, like, you know, like showing that in general, like some people with back pain, they, they got uh, they, they got better or, or that the people get reduced anxiety. And it's difficult to check this, that this pose is actually doing what they, they, they are claiming that it is doing. And that's probably coming more from the experience of the, the spirit yogi. And I think it's like that the, there is not there is no danger in it. <laughs> and it might be that they dispose they were this way, and there is no no harm to it. And it's actually uh, I lost the the thought that actually it's also uh, uh, yoga. Yeah. It, it comes like together. So because you do all different things. Then that's how it improves usually for many people. It improves the way you breathe and your digestion and improves the way you move. And, and it's true because for many different reasons, because of many different approaches you do, because you move better, because you start to listen to your body, because you change your diet probably. So many people become vegetarians and this is really proof that it will have very good effect on health. So, yeah, so I think that there are claims like that. Sometimes they're used for the marketing, uh, but there is nothing, yeah, there's no harm. <laughs> as long as, you know, they don't make you lose okay. because of that. But yeah, it's, it's not proved, but it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's not true. <laughs> you just don't know. And I think also on the medical side of, side of you, it's like what I was lacking in medicine. It's a, it's a bit of like admitting that we don't know and that we cannot check everything with the research, that there are limits to it and then there are things beyond it. And that's that's what I like about yoga, that it's kind of in some aspects it's beyond the what we know. Mm. That's a great answer. I, I really like like how you answered it and how you also maintain a sense of balance here. Because I, I tend to, especially when I go, I, I appreciate both sides. I appreciate that there's a very positive side to the to yoga obviously as well. But when I when I dig into the dark side, I usually just kind of um, <laughs> yeah, like, oh, yeah. Right here, but like, yeah, I'm going to destroy this, and, and I enjoy how you are balancing uh, it in a very gentle way. So it, it's a nice answer. Uh, and I just have a couple more questions, and but one of them it, it will probably take a whole different episode to a conversation to unwrap the whole uh, subject that I'll bring in, but. But for this this time, I will just want to ask your kind of a general opinion in terms of um, yoga as a spiritual practice. And again, I, I forgive me, forgive me everyone for this, but I'm I'm, I'm looking at the dark side of it today, uh, and just wanting to ask you in terms of yoga having the spiritual side. Do you feel like there's any danger with that element of it? Like people, let's let's say going with. I know it's a kind of a wide subject, but hopefully I can just ask you for a general opinion. But let's say people going with uh, um, sensitive uh, mindset or like uh, health, mental health issues, uh, do, do you hear of occurrences where yoga can be dangerous for, for people like that and when it really is spiritual or anything else you have to say something about that? Well, this is for me personally difficult to answer because I've been for most of my of my uh, like all the years I've been practicing yoga. I was I was very much down to earth, <laughs> yeah. so I was not really exploring this. I mean, I was exploring in terms of I was really from the very beginning interested in the texts, like classical texts about yoga. Or I would read Bhagavad Gita, or you know, like I was like or, or all about yamas, niyamas, like all these sides of things I found really interesting for myself. So and and it really helped me at the time. 
because mm. like as I said I was young so then like you have this like inspiration to be moral in your life <laughs> that mm. for me myself it was very helpful so it helped me you know like, to it really introduced me to this ahimsa so that you really don't hurt others you know you don't hurt yourself and you really pay attention to it like in everything you do so for me this like this spiritual side it's still like kind of spiritual uh, it really helped me and that's and and like what i read about it and and all the philosophy i i got to know but uh, and all but and i think that yoga is is like it brings this like it kind of at least my, can help to spark this spirituality in people just by the fact that they suddenly like in shavasana the last pose like that so when you just lay down <laughs> and then they usually you know when they relax and then they can for a moment they're like encouraged to just be in the moment and for a second not to think that I am this, I am, I don't know, <laughs> I am engineer and I work there and like this is my ego and, and I will have my plans and my memories and they, they kind of have a moment out of it and I think that like, I've seen it in many people that really like opens their life to something that like, brings more space and, in their lives. But when it comes like the spiritual, spiritual, like when it comes to the rituals <laughs> and, uh, and that you have to do like some weird stuff, like I always like just I'll stay away from it. So same for yoga, same for meditation. So in Vipassana, it's like as simple as it can be, no rituals involved. And and that's what I was always attracted to. So it's difficult for, for me to say because I don't have like personal experience with like more woo -woo right. <laughs> stuff. Yeah. But probably there is some good stuff about it too. But uh, and bad, but I don't have enough experience with it. Mm. Great. Uh, well something you mentioned uh, now and actually in the beginning of the conversation is uh, I think you just slightly mentioned but I, I definitely caught my attention is that uh, we're so much in our heads these days and we're we're very much an intellectual society always thinking about the future the past and analyzing and trying to understand things always looking at the screen and collecting information and when when I used to teach myself I, I was I kept being uh, kind of attentive to that idea as well and and one of the ways I presented yoga or I, I kind of I would kept keep asking myself so why do I teach yoga why why would I not send people to just a fitness instructor or, per se and one of my one of my main answers was because yoga also has that quality of bringing the people into the moment people would usually really be happy about the shavasana part <laughs> and yeah. and, I felt, and I felt you know that's that's a great thing people wouldn't stop uh, unless they're going to sleep, but otherwise usually people don't stop uh, in their daily lives. They're always kind of doing something and, and then in a yoga class, they're not necessarily forced, but they have the conditions to, to do that. Uh, so that was like an important part for me. I wonder if, if, if you put that as an emphasis on yoga as well. And, and plus with that, uh, how do you describe um, like what's what makes yoga unique to you? Uh, why why choose yoga instead of just fitness? Yeah, so that's uh, that's a great question. It's just very true what you said. It's very true for me as well. So basically, yes, exactly, exactly that. So like in yoga, in three, like okay, starting from the beginning. So yes, like yeah. we are very much like as a generation, especially in the head. Even more like now, not even in the head, but in some virtual world that doesn't even exist. <laughs> like yeah. anything may exist outside your head, but there is even more like virtual stuff. And always and under all this pressure and overstimulated, like we're really stimulated all the time, like to the exhaustion. Yeah. exhaustion. So I think that like I find, and that's what being yoga for me for all the years, like it's like a safe place where you can go. <laughs> And you can, for at least this time, you can just forget, like, you know, about all your tasks, about who you think you are, and then just come back to your body and just really reconnect. That, that's for me what it is. Like, you reconnect with your body. And then you, and then, because, like, movement itself and physical side of it, like, actually helps you to, try, to trick your mind. Because if you just sit and observe, your, your mind, for most of people, like, will immediately go for a trip. So actually, you're going to trick your mind a bit. <laughs> so it's yeah. challenging. 
he also learned, you know, to stay because we are like, I call it, call it Facebook generation. So we either like and dislike everything all the time, conscious or unconscious, not even generation. It's like a human nature. Like we respond to everything with a judgment. I like, I don't like, I like, I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, and then in yoga, there's lots of focus on that, you know, that just acceptance of what happens, acceptance of your limitations in the poses, but still trying to do your best. So then you accept <laughs> that you can't, then you realize the limitations, the, and, but you are not being lazy, and just, but still you try to do, and then you concentrate your mind, you try to listen to your body, and then you do it for some period of time, and then it's very important that at the end there is this moment where there is shavasana, so the relaxation, and then and then you remove the effort of it, and then you just leave the pure uh, observation of, of what is happening, and just pure acceptance, and then you just stay there. And for me, and then also the fact that ideally it's not competitive, that it's, you are there on your mat, you're alone, even if it's a room full of people, but still you're alone. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what is doing the person next to you, and then you just get to, to know yourself, get to know your body, get to like say hello to your toes. <laughs> I'm certain toes, but yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you say hello to your hand, and then you also, just realize how patient your body was with you because people abused <laughs> their bodies all day long. Like the way I'm obsessed with posture, but like, yes, yoga is dangerous, but what, or any physical activity, what's more dangerous is that yoga or a video or anything else, you do one hour per day or two hours per day. But the question is what you do for the rest of the time. Most of right. the time, many people sitting <laughs> in front of the computer, <laughs> like, completely abusing their body in the posture they take, not even realizing it. And yeah. then I hope that that's, con that that's the awareness that yoga can bring to and really change life because then you sit in front of your computer, <laughs> but maybe with calculator, maybe you will get to listen to your body before it has to shout to pay with some you know. So, so for, to me, that's the main difference between yoga. And then it mm. also opens your mind like to new ideas like you know, like all the ahimsa stuff, and, and just yeah, just re like even realizing that you're alive. I think it's, it's really. <laughs> yeah. like we tend to forget like how how unique it is that we are mm. here and that it's not for long and that there is everything changing. So, so lots of things. Yes, I can talk about it forever, but <laughs> <laughs> but I stop my day. <laughs> no, I, I really like your answer again. Yeah, I really appreciate. it. I think it's it's a great perspective. And uh, I think probably this will be my last question. It's almost like a follow-up to what you said yeah. uh, in terms of the positive side. And I'll just say a quick disclaimer. Uh, I One of the reasons I started this chain of conversations of exploring yoga, kind of the, well, the dark side of yoga, I, I, I tend to focus on it partly because I feel the positive side is being already spoken yeah. around everywhere. You know, especially yoga instructors or like like yoga journal or big yoga organizations they're 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 very invested into talking positive about yoga because they need their clients and the reputation but uh, it's it's harder to come across information about some of the lacking sides the, yeah. the, the downside to this for me is that when I make videos like that then people think that I think that yoga is horrible and that's it so <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wanted to make sure to to balance that out. And uh, uh, before we end the conversation, you, you already mentioned a lot of very positive aspects of yoga. Uh, but uh, because I asked you a lot about the dark side of this kind of the physical side of yoga, uh, to shift the conversation, and uh, I'd like to ask you about the positive side of the physical aspects of yoga. As Again, as a doctor and as a yoga instructor, uh, what benefits have you seen uh, yourself like have you seen people healing long long-term uh, traumas injuries or or people just becoming more healthy like what was your observation in regards to like a, like physical health uh, through yoga yeah so uh, I think what we need to also mention uh, before answering these questions is that yoga is a very general term so yoga mm -hmm. is huge so there is yoga, Iyengar yoga, there is Ashtanga yoga, there is uh, Vinyasa style, there is this style, that style, uh, hot yoga, power yoga. <laughs> like it's really huge. So, so it's really difficult as well to, 
talk general about it because I think like also for those who listen that they might not uh, realize that there, there are these differences. And um, so, so what applies to one style does not necessarily apply to another style. So, so that, that's a tricky part of it. And also about uh, like talking about downside or the positive side of things. Then again, it really depends a lot on which style uh, you are practicing. It depends a lot on who you're practicing with. So even within the same style, <laughs> you will have different teachers and uh, different perspectives. And then, and then also you will have difficult, different outcomes, different positive and negative sides. Uh, but so, so keeping that in mind, <laughs> uh, what are the positive sides of yoga I've seen uh, on the physical level? A lot. So basically, oh, also about talking about like my students or other people I've seen, like they improve definitely their body awareness, which is physical and physical is like on the border of the two. But because they develop this awareness, then they are like quicker realizing that something is going wrong. And it's very important because normally people just don't realize until it's too late. Right. And then uh, they really, when, when it comes to back pain, it's really, I actually like a huge progress in, in many people. Also keeping in mind that back pain is a symptom. <laughs> it's not actual disease, it's a symptom, it has different different reasons. And that's why like, I, I really am not uh, a fan of like 10 poses for back pain because it's a symptom. <laughs> so like, yes, it may help people with this kind of reason for that, but this, but it should absolutely contraindicated for this population with as well back pain. So, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, so, so basically the people get stronger, they get, uh, they get uh, many, they at least, elevated the back pain and then they move better and then the many times they also the, the digestion becomes better. I've seen it's also on the on the on the border of the food, but people uh, suffering from some neurosis. So basically they are stressed and then they have like all different kinds of pains which are actually coming from the psychological stress. They uh, like it was also my case <laughs> when I started yoga I had lots of like the weird things, I thought I had a heart attack at the time, at the age of 16, but I didn't, I was just stressed. And these kind of pains, like, they, like, they disappeared in, in one month. And also just because yoga, especially this more, like, mindful way of, like, of practicing, hopefully, as well, it really helps to reduce stress. Oh, no, yeah, also, yeah, any time, actually, any type of yoga, they, they help to really reduce stress. And stress is a risk a risk factor in almost every disease that you can find. Right. And also it helps to change your whole lifestyle. So actually the change people experience in their life is, is because like because they started to, to practice yoga. So usually it means that they got surrounded by people who have quite healthy lifestyle. So then little by little they start to change the, the way they live their life. They maybe walk more, they eat more vegetables as <laughs> well, they drink more, they move more. And all in all in total it really brings a huge change in your life. Nice. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> oh yeah, great. You, you actually answered all questions really well, so I, I appreciate it. Uh, and the, the very last part, uh, for people who are interested to know more about you potentially living in your area or or maybe you offer especially these days it's it's kind of a common thing a common question about online courses private classes is there some online resource or anything that uh, could help people find you and more about your work yeah absolutely i have my uh, so yeah I, these days i've learned <laughs> thank you very much i've learned to, to also do yoga to, to do online classes and actually i was surprised that they were they were, uh, well, obviously, it's a different thing that we do during online classes than like classes. Like, uh, I have to adjust, but still, uh, it, it works nice. So, so I, I do that. I do also live classes. I also do uh, group, uh, group classes uh, in Mocha. And, uh, and, but all of this is, is on my website. So I have uh, the website yoga slash uh, martinado.ch uh, and uh, all the information. Is there information in English there as well, or is it just? It's only in English. It's only in English. Only in English. 
Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah my French is not so so well yet. I learned, uh, but it's all in English, and I mainly I mainly teach uh, in English. I I've been in French as well, but but my French is not as as great as I I wish. So yeah, so yoga. Uh, I think, yeah, yoga dash matinabit. Oh, just in case, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to clarify and I'll leave the link. So, uh, perfect. Can, I have a feeling there will be people who will be inspired to contact with you because you know, there's, you, you know, way more than most yoga instructors, I, 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 I would presume. So, great. But thank, uh, you. thank you very much. That was a really nice conversation. That was exactly what I, uh, I was looking for. And, uh, uh, I, I won't be surprised if somewhere down the road in the future I'll, I'll write to you again because <laughs> yeah. again, you have so much positive and good knowledge and, and I really enjoyed your approach as well to it all. So, so thank you very much. Thank you for, for the conversation. Thank you. Too. I really enjoyed the, the, to talk, like talking to you and also the way you do the interview and how much space you leave and how open and positive mm. you are. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much right. for thank you. Thank you. That's, that means a lot to me.